The solar system is an interesting place geologically. In many ways, the terrestrial planets within it share commonalities, such as that produced by volcanism, but in other ways they are markedly different. There are objects in the outer solar system that are pristine, and present evidence for the very earliest geology to have occurred within the solar system when it was young, evidence of which has long been lost on geologically active planets like Earth. By studying the geological makeup of the solar system, we are able to reconstruct its history. From the geology on Mars, for example, we've learned that this now cold, perhaps dead world was once warm with liquid water on its surface, creating the water-related geology we see today, standing as a testament that that planet might once have been habitable. As we further explore the solar system through sample return missions and robotic geologists like Curiosity, we will learn even more about its origins. And just maybe we might find evidence that it once had two bodies or more that may have once hosted life. And just maybe they still might. Welcome to Event Horizon with your host, John Michael Godier. is joined today by Emily Lakdawala. Emily is a senior editor and planetary evangelist at the Planetary Society. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geology from Amherst College and a Master of Science degree in Planetary Geology from Brown University. Asteroid 274860 was formally named Emily Lakdawala by the International Astronomical Union on July 12, 2014, in her honor. Emily Lakdawalla, welcome to the program. So happy to be here. Now, we've been studying Martian geology for quite some time, and we've been sending spacecraft there since the 1970s. Uh, what have we learned? I guess the, the main thing that we know is, is that there was the action of water there, but what have we learned geologically about Mars in those years? We've learned that Mars and Earth probably started out looking a lot more similar than they do today. They're both terrestrial planets, they're made of roughly the same proportion of materials, and they were both hot in their youth, hot enough to differentiate. That is, their materials separated into a metal core and a rocky, a rocky mantle that formed another rocky crust above that. They also both got hot enough for their cores to melt and set up a magnetic field, a, dy a dynamo. And we think probably that Mars's core is still partially molten, just like Earth's is, but that for whatever reason, the dynamo shut down and Mars doesn't have its magnetic field anymore. And so the main difference between the two worlds is that Mars lost its primordial heat much faster because it's a smaller world. And that led to the shutdown of a lot of the processes that are still operating on Earth. And I think that the the main insights we've had from the the era of the second era of Mar Mars exploration that began with Mars Global Surveyor and Pathfinder landing in in 1997 is that is the insight into the early part of Mars's history when it was much more Earth-like. We know that there was water flowing across the surface. We know that it pooled and lasted in those pools for a long time. Like at Gale Crater, where Curiosity is still rolling around, we know that the the there were lakes filling that crater f uh, continuously for millions, maybe even tens of millions of years, possibly even a hundred million years. So that's a long time to have a stable, very pleasantly chemical environment, not too acid, not too basic, but the kind of thing where you could get kind of organic chemistry uh, moving around, possibly. We also know that Mars wasn't too Earth-like. Uh, it seems pretty likely that it was always a lot colder in general, kind of more Antarctica-like than, you know, Brazil-like. 
So um, it it would have been a different place, but it had a lot of the same materials uh, with the same kind of water cycles of uh, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, runoff down rocky slopes, dissolving minerals and carrying them all into ocean basins or, or lake basins. And so it stands to reason that given the same materials under the same conditions, the same events should happen. That's physics. And, and the thing that happened on Earth was life started. And so it's actually a little bit surprising that we haven't yet found any evidence for ancient life on Mars, but and it's also why we're still looking very hard. What do you think about the prospects of, of current microbial life on Mars below the surface? You know, I think that if life did start on Mars in the past, there's a distinct possibility that it exists now deep below the surface. It would be the best habitat for life on Mars right now. Um, life on the surface is very hard because the solar radiation is really terrible. Um, plus, you have a, a, ke a chemistry in the soil on the surface of Mars that is full of these highly oxidizing chemicals, things like hydrogen peroxide and perchlorate. They're the kinds of oxidizing chemicals that you might use to clean things of organic contamination on Earth because the, the oxidizers attack the big organic molecules and bust them up into smaller pieces. And, and generally, it's very hard uh, for life to survive in that environment. There is there is life on Earth that survives in, in environments containing these kinds of strong oxidizers, but um, it's, it's not the kind of environment that you would expect life to originate in. And so my feeling is that if life exists on Mars, it does pretty far below the surface, kilometers beneath the surface, where you still have hot rock and hot groundwater doing its chemical thing together. Is it possible that those chemicals like the perchlorates go down that deep? I mean, would they do they present an issue for any subsurface life if it's living in an aquifer or something like that? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer for sure. I do know that the um, peroxide is generated at the surface. So it's generated by interaction by like... Um, uh, electrical uh, events in the atmosphere interacting with gases in the atmosphere. So presumably it's more concentrated at the surface than at depth. And I think the question of how much the atmosphere of Mars communicates with the deep uh, groundwater and ground ice is something, is an area of active research for Mars atmospheric scientists. But I don't really know the answer to that question. Now it's interesting, um, we, we keep getting tantalizing hints. For example, you know, methane levels will rise at opportunity out of nowhere and it's sort of you know some people have suggested that that might be indicative of of um, subsurface microbial life blooming you know like an algae bloom or something like that but do you think that that's more likely to be geologic in nature rather than biological I think right now the you know the Occam's razor uh, hypothesis would be a geological event but I think it's important to keep um, biology in your back pocket as one of your many hypotheses. I don't think it would be responsible scientifically not to consider it, uh, but just because it's in your uh, your arsenal of possible explanations doesn't mean it's a very likely one. And so I would I would always just look at the data, which are um, it's it's a difficult detection and it's not yet been corroborated by other instruments. And so. Uh, even the data is a little suspect at this point. You just have to take everything skeptically and keep, um, uh, you know, keep all of your options open while you continue to explore the question. That's a scientifically responsible thing to do. Indeed. Now, speaking of volcanism on Mars, um, Mars obviously once had very serious volcanism. It's got, you know, the largest volcano in the solar system is sitting there. Is there any activity left on Mars volcanically? On the surface? Um, I believe that there, well, yes and no. So the question is, uh, is what kind of time scale you're thinking about? So the evidence suggests that uh, volcanism on Mars has um, continued down pretty close to the present. I think some of the youngest volcanism on Mars, the, the crater counting suggests that it might have happened 10 or 20 million years ago. And you know, that's a long time to us. But in terms of the four and a half billion year age of Mars, it's nothing. And so the fact that you have evidence for volcanism you know, 20 million years ago suggests that it's possible you could have another volcano pop up sometime. We're probably never going to see one, um, but it could certainly happen again. Definitely, there's still quite a bit of heat inside Mars, and that heat does have to get out one way or another. And usually it's enough for a planet of this size and this age for it to radiate, just kind of radiating out of the surface. But there could be another little burp of volcanism sometime in the future, maybe two, 20 million years from now. 
Interesting. So, because, you know, Mars is kind of, back in the 90s when I first became interested in this stuff, it was considered a dead world, you know, that there was nothing going on there. And now it seems that it's actually quite a bit more dynamic than what was thought back then. Yeah, I think you have to avoid thinking in absolutes. So um, it's dynamic. Uh, One of the ways it's very dynamic is in its weather and climate, because Mars doesn't have a large moon to stabilize its axial tilt. Over the course of uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of years, its rotation axis can actually tilt over quite steeply, like down to 60, 70 degrees. Currently, its its axial tilt is like Earth. It has Earth-like seasons. But when it um, when it tilts farther, it has more Uranus-like seasons, where huge areas get sun continuously for a huge amount of its orbit. Um, under those circumstances, you'd melt the polar caps and and form maybe a, a, a equatorial ring, actually, of not not like a ring in space, but a ring on the surface of of frosty or icy material. And so those kinds of changes are still happening on Mars. And so the the surface can actually change in the present day quite a bit just from the action of wind and frost and, um, you know, dust storms and other events. Uh, The surface is really very dynamic and there is still activity in the interior. The question is just whether any of the interior activity pops out on the surface. That's one of the the cool results we're going to get from the InSight mission, which recently landed last November. It's got a seismometer, the first good seismometer right down on the surface of Mars. And it's going to be able to tell us how active Mars is internally, whether there's very many Mars quakes. Now, yeah, which, you you know, you have to wonder, it would presumably have fault lines and all sorts of the same things that Earth has. Yeah. Um, Now, you wrote a book, The Design and Engineering of Curiosity, How the Mars Rover Performs Its Job. Now, Curiosity essentially is a robot geologist. Um, Now, tell us about that. Tell us what what have we learned geologically from Curiosity at the site that it's at? Well, Curiosity was sent to a really special landing site. The the previous landers were all sent to landing sites that bore rocks that came from uh, later, uh, more recent eras of Mars's geologic history. Curiosity is the first one to be sent to a site that's as old as the site it was sent to. And uh, so it came from pretty early um, in Mars's geologic history. It was still after all the great big basins formed, but it formed at a time when there was still um, some kind of water cycle happening at the surface. It's not clear whether that was frequent rainfall with uh, continuously running rivers into continuously present lakes, or if you're more talking about like a, a, a dry, Antarctica-like situation with dry snow deposits that every once in a while they get melted and run some water off in a river and maybe you have ice-covered lakes. Those things aren't really clear yet, but the point is that you did have an active water cycle and it created a place where there was liquid water stable um, in, in various places on the surface for a pretty long period of Mars's history. So like one of the very first things that Curiosity discovered was this rock deposit that it looked just like broken concrete. You can see like a slab of tilted rock that has um, like a fine uh, material uh, surrounding an aggregate of rounded pebbles. And uh, any geologist will tell you that a rounded pebble had to be rounded in running water. And so that those images, which were taken just weeks after they landed, showed you that Curiosity was rolling across a place where once there was a river somewhere between ankle to hip deep that was flowing down the inside of that crater. And that was just really, that was a spectacular find. That really lets you know, here we are looking at a place on Mars where there was this surface water doing a very Earth-like thing, just trickling. You can imagine the sound even running downhill, rolling rocks as it went, and presumably running downhill into a lake, which Curiosity then later has rolled into the very fine-grained deposits from the deep uh, part of the lake bottom and has just seen layer upon layer upon layer. So many seasons and years are recorded in these layered rocks in Gale Crater. It's it's really quite wonderful. Now, speaking of layered sedimentary rocks, um, I think it was Opportunity, wasn't it, that the, the crater that it literally landed in mm-hmm. <laughs> had an outcrop. And that outcrop turned out to be incredibly interesting with... Um, geologic things like blueberries, which appear to be, you know, due to water and interaction with water as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I was actually fortunate enough to be inside mission control, inside the science team at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory when that landing happened. And when those first images popped up on the wall, there was such a jubilation in the science team because uh, you could see, A, you were inside a crater, you were staring at a cut through rocks and you knew from seeing the layers in those rocks from a distance that that was intact bedrock 
And that was a first. You know, we'd never landed in a place where you were could actually roll right up to intact bedrock. And intactness is so important for geologists. It's like the difference between having an encyclopedia and having like a shredded version of the encyclopedia because all the pages are in order and you can just read them in order from bottom to top to see the the history of that particular spot. And so um, Opportunity rolled up to that rock and found, uh, it did find the blueberries, which were important because it was the chemical signal of those blueberries from a mineral called hematite that had actually brought Opportunity to that landing site in the first place. And uh, hematite of that type really only forms in places where there is uh, liquid water activity. The rocks that the hematite were in were a either a, uh, a sandy deposit or a precipitate, which means that it, it actually formed chemically right out of being dissolved in water, of a uh, calcium sulfate material. And the important thing about that is that it requires a very acid water. So it told us that there had been water there, quite a bit of it actually, and there was water both when the rocks were formed and later on when those hematite concretions formed inside the rocks. So there was a lot of water, but chemically it was kind of a nasty environment. It was very acid. And so we have uh, places on earth where there are those uh, types of sulfate deposits forming now. There are uh, places where you have like acid mine drainage and, and other uh, stuff or like drainage off of volcanoes. And there, there is uh, life forms on Earth that can live in those kinds of environments, but it is challenging. It's chemically very challenging environment to live in. And so the big difference between opportunity and curiosity is that the rocks that curiosity is studying aren't so acid. They record a time when water, the chemistry was much nicer. It was much more neutral pH, and you could have a much broader range of, of different kinds of chemical reactions happening. So again, once again, Mars even in its distant past when it had liquid water, was a very dynamic place with very different environments, even within circumstance of having liquid water. Yes, but they were in different times. So to make it clear, Opportunity landed in a place where it's it's probably looking at rocks that are three or 400 million years younger than the ones that Curiosity is looking at. And so what you're seeing there is that Mars had this evolutionary history where it went from being a more earthish type of place to one where water was rarer, it was more acid, there was proportionally a lot more volcanic activity. It uh, it became kind of a, a, a not very nice place to live after the, uh, the earlier environments. So that's interesting. So it goes from a clement environment to a not very nice environment. And then of course, today we have an environment where it's very unlikely anything could survive on the surface at all. Exactly. Um, so it shows the essentially the the death of a planet through climate change, effectively, as as it just as everything just keeps changing, it can't it can't form an equilibrium like Earth could, or at least as long as Earth could. Right, and the main culprit in that is the loss of Mars's magnetic field, because without the magnetic field, um, the the atmosphere got stripped away by the solar wind, and we actually have a spacecraft up there right now, Maven that's studying the process as it continues to happen today. It's it's seeing how the, the sun, especially when it goes through more active periods or has flares, is just tearing away Mars's atmosphere and making it more and more difficult to live in. It's interesting. So the dynamo shut down and that kills off the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. But what what is the, do, do we know what the process of that is? Are there any ideas on why the dynamo shut down? Is it just the partial cooling of the core did it or, or what was that yeah I, um, I think there are lots of ideas but they're pretty theoretical and the fact is we don't even really know what the internal structure of Mars is today and so uh, the insight mission is going to help us a lot to kind of solidify some of those theories um, in order to to try to winnow down some of the possibilities for how Mars changed over time at least we'll know what it looks like today and then we can kind of reason backwards and on that, we have to take another break. When we come back, we'll talk about future Mars missions and the rest of the solar system. For next week's second part episode of my new conversation with Dr. Avi Loeb, on Thursday, January 31st at 5 p.m. Eastern, we will be doing it as a YouTube premiere. I will be live in the chat during the episode starting at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, taking your questions as well as giving you all some news about upcoming events for Event Horizon. 
So subscribe and turn on your notifications so you can be sure to make it for the live question and answer premiere on Thursday, January 31st at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central. And if you can't make it, don't worry, the episode will have a replay option for the live chat. See you then. John. The red light on the answer phone is flashing. What answer phone? You have two new messages. First message. Dear John, I've solved that problem with Anna's uplink, by the way. Uh, you need to stop using them cheap cables. Second message. Hi, can you call me back on the uh, the extension 4, please, regarding the hyperconnect? Thank you. End of messages. Hey, turn that off. And I'm back with Emily Lactawalla. Now, we were talking about Mars and the, the past exploration, current exploration of Mars, but there are plans to continue this study of Martian geology into the future. What what do we have planned? So there's a lot of mission planned, but probably the ones you'll be most interested in are two rovers proposed for launch in 2020. There's one being built by NASA and one being built by ESA. And they're taking two really interestingly different approaches to the next steps in studying Mars. Curiosity has established that Mars had a habitable environment. So we know that life, if it existed, could have thrived on ancient Mars in these environments. So now the question is, did it? And it's it's hard to figure that out uh, just by going to the surface because you don't know if you've landed in the right spot. But that's the approach that the European Space Agency is taking. They're equipping a rover with a deep drill, one that can drill down about two meters And so they're going to be going around to a few different locations, drilling deeply to try to get below the parts of the rock that have been damaged by solar radiation, to try to drill into stuff that hasn't been exposed for hundreds of millions of years in order to see if there are any remnants of organic life forms preserved in those rocks, and also to study what the chemistry of ancient Mars was like. For for both of these missions, they're not failures if they fail to detect life that they still have really important science goals. So that even if if life is not something that they discover, they, they'll still be learning a lot about ancient Mars. Um, so that's ESA's mission. NASA's mission instead is bringing a drill that can collect samples. And then all the rest of its instrument package is designed to document those samples, document where they came from and the rock strata, what the chemistry of the rocks around it was and that kind of thing. And it's going to be collecting all these samples and building a sample cache for a future mission to bring back to Earth. Um, Mars sample return is something that the Mars community has wanted and planned for for decades. It's always been 20 years in the future. Any year you look at it, it's always been 20 years from now. We'll get Mars sample return done. Mars 2020 is going to collect the samples, but we actually haven't designed the mission yet to pick them up and retrieve them, which sounds a little bit weird. But um, I talked with the project scientist for Mars 2020, and he said, no, this is really very rational. You want to make sure, first of all, that your sample collection mission works before you start building and getting ready to launch the return mission. And second of all, the first mission is going to teach you a lot about the landing site and what you need to do to navigate around the landing site to be able to pick up those samples. And so um, he's convinced me that it's quite reasonable to wait at least until you've landed and demonstrated that your mission to collect samples works before you start developing the the uh, mission that's going to return those samples back to Earth. Once they're back on Earth, we'll be able to bring to bear all the laboratories of the world on studying what these you know 20 different samples of rocks from all over a landing site on Mars contain. So if we succeed in that, it's going to be absolutely huge. But We don't have this mission planned yet, so who knows when we're going to get those samples back to Earth. Yeah, and you also have wild cards like Elon Musk, who (laughs) may well end up there faster than anybody realizes. Now, when 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 you're talking about a sample return, I suppose the most interesting rocks as far as looking for life would be the sedimentary ones, right? But what are, what else is there? there? There would be a lot of volcanic basalts and things like that present. But what what is the most interesting thing we could return from Mars as a sample? Well, it's not just the type of rock, but also the context. So sedimentary rocks, yes, are, the, are some of the most likely to preserve evidence of organic life. But it's important where you collect them from. So that rock that I talked about early on, the one that Curiosity found evidence of a river flowing downhill, that's not the kind of rock you'd want to bring back for evidence of organics, because it's a very high energy environment, materials flowing from one place to another place. You're not likely to get good preservation of organics in that environment. But if you go to the to the lake and go to the very foot, 
of the gle- of the uh, delta. So where a river empties into a lake, it deposits all of its sediment. The sediment keeps moving, the water slows down, and at the very, very bottom of the lake where the water finally gets still is where you get the very finest sediment, and it concentrates all the fine material from all the different rivers that float into the lake. So that's where you want to go to find the, the most likely place to, to find evidence for ancient life. There's other kinds of rocks you want to collect. Uh, Mars 2020 has picked a landing site called Jezero Crater that has a beautiful delta in it. They'll be going to the toe of that delta, certainly as one of their top priorities to pick up some rock. But after the delta formed, most of the crater floor was filled with basalt. And it's kind of a middle-aged basalt for Mars. It's not super ancient. It's not super young. And so if we can bring back a sample of that, we can do age dating on Mars much more accurately than we've ever been able to. We have really accurate age dating for the history of the moon thanks to the Apollo samples that were returned because they picked up all these different volcanic rocks and brought them back. And we did, you know, lead argon dating and argon argon dating to find out how old all those rocks were. We don't have any samples from Mars from known locations, from places where we know where they came from. So if we get a sample of or two of the basalt that fills this crater floor, it will so help us uh, understand the the ages of the geologic history of Mars and how it compares to the geologic history of Earth and the Moon. And that'll be a really big deal. Um, there's a few other kinds of rocks they want to collect. There's some evaporites that would be really interesting. Um, they may drive right out of the crater and get up into the parts of the crater, the highlands, where you preserve the rocks that the crater first formed in, which are super duper ancient, and can also tell you about what the the starter material for the sediment that filled the lakes was. So they've given this a lot of thought. They've pretty much identified the first 20 samples they'd like to be able to grab after they land in the crater. So um, they're ready to go. So now the rest of the solar system, in context with, with Mars, what is the next most interesting thing geologically? What What is the next most interesting planet? Where, If you if you could say, okay, I as a geologist, I want to go here. What's the next place after Mars? Well, as a, as a hard rock geologist, as a terrestrial planet person, I can never pick favorites, but I'll, I'll tell you two. <laughs> two places I want to go. I desperately want to get beneath the clouds on Venus and see what the rocks on Venus look like. Try to understand... The, the volcanoes and rifting and all the tectonics we see there. Try to figure out if volcanism is actually still active today there. It's a whole planet that we've only ever seen in radar and a couple of photographs taken by Russian spacecraft when they landed in two spots. And it's a fascinating world. And I, I would just love to get better images, to actual optical photographs taken beneath the clouds of... Um, of the surface of Venus, because, you know, that's a whole giant world. It's the same size as Earth, made of the same stuff. And and boy, has it had a different geologic history. And that's just a, a fascinating puzzle. The other one is Io. So way out there in the outer solar system, um, the innermost moon of Jupiter is a terrestrial world, an iron and rock mostly world that is continuously erupting. It has like 30 volcanoes firing off all the time. And what a fantastic place that would be for a geologist to go visit. So I guess those are my two favorites right now. So now let's talk about those. Venus. Um, Venus is a weird one because it seems to resurface itself every 300 to 500 million years or something along those scales, suggesting that its volcanism could be radically different from anywhere else, Um, even to the point that it may just have one planet-wide lava flow that completely erases everything. That would suggest that, that Venus is, is, is a young object on its surface. And geologically speaking, that wouldn't tell you much about its history before the resurfacing, but it would tell you about the geology of what's going on with the planet. What, what, do, you, what do you tend to favor? Do you think Venus is just a radically different world from Earth in, in the sense of volcanoes? Well, you know... It's true that Venus is radically different from Earth, but Earth is really the oddball here. Uh, We've never seen evidence for plate tectonics operating on any other world in the solar system. Venus and Mars and the Moon are all one-plate worlds. So they're all worlds that still have internal heat. That internal heat is trying to get out, and it's trapped underneath this uh, this solid lid that doesn't have any breaks in it. And so those all three of them are just still radiating their heat to space. The difference with Venus is that it's quite big in proportion to its surface area. And so it doesn't have, uh, it may not be able to get rid of its heat fast enough through just conduction. 
So um, it, and that's why it has active volcanism. I think the jury's still out on whether it had this paroxysm of global resurfacing all at once or whether it's just v volcanically active right now with big bursts of volcanism here and there over time and all those shield fields with, I mean, there are millions and millions of volcanoes on Venus and we just don't know if any of them is currently active. And so, like Earth, it does, as you say, have a youthful surface. On average, its surface is about the same age as Earth's surface. But we don't know if it is uh, all the same age or if there is some kind of continuous resurfacing going on. I actually did my master's work on the geolo geologic history of Venus, and I think that there's uh, strong opinions on both sides of the argument, and I don't think either one has con convinced the community. I think that it's still a really open question, which is why I'd be so excited to get a better, um, a good imaging mission, a good geology mission to go back and study the you know, the landforms and whether there's still activity and, and how often things have changed and just get better resolution. I mean, we can't really see things very well. The Magellan data set is wonderful, but it's low resolution. It, and uh, we, need, we need better imaging down there. Now, Venus is a much, much harder planet to put a spacecraft on that's going to last longer than, I think, what's, what's, what was the record, an hour, something like that, that, that uh, back when the Soviets were landing on it? Are there any any missions planned? Anything planned for Venus to land on it and check out the geology? There is a, a European mission going through the works, um, but the Europeans tend to be more focused on atmosphere than they are on the surface. It's uh, I don't know why there's that cultural difference, but it exists. It's kind of funny. The NASA missions focus more on geology. Europeans focus more on atmosphere. The Japanese focus more on upper atmosphere and magnetosphere. It's 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 a it's a funny way that that different countries have kind of subdivided the parts of a planet. So NASA is not currently preparing any future mission to Venus, much to the woe of the Venus community. Uh, there have been missions. My favorite mission idea proposed is one that would take your platform, your imaging platform and other remote sensing tools, and put them on a balloon that floats high in the atmosphere where the temperature is much lower and the pressure is much more lower. You get basically room temp. You get comfortable temperatures if you're high enough in the atmosphere, and yet you're still below the cloud decks. And you could float around for quite a while with a balloon studying the surface and even drop down um, to sample and see the a profile of the atmosphere and uh, maybe not get all the way to the surface to sample. But you can still see things in higher resolution at lower elevation or go up to high elevations and get more regional views. It would be a really super cool mission. Now, the... the Interesting thing, as you as you touched on about Venus, is that at at some layer in Venus's atmosphere, it's the most Earth-like environment in the solar system, in that you have similar pressures and temperatures to Earth that allows you know the possibility of maybe one day putting in somebody in the atmosphere of Venus, if not on the you can't on the surface, of course. But that brings up the question: is that Venus is another world that may have had a period where it had liquid water early on? And again, presumably, maybe could have um, the genesis of microbial life on it. Now, some people talk about maybe that would still be alive in the upper atmosphere, having adapted or something like that. But do you think that that's a good candidate for life? Or do you think Venus is just not likely any longer to harbor anything? You know, I don't really, um, I don't think I know enough to make that judgment call. There are people who I respect who say that it is a possibility. And so I'm inclined to believe them until I'm shown otherwise. You also mentioned Io. Now, nothing is, that I know of is planned for Io. Um, Io is a very, very different environment, given that it's being irradiated by Jupiter in addition to being wildly volcanic. But what, what will we learn there? Now, this isn't a, a planet-sized object. This is a moon, and presumably the volcanism there might, might be different. In what way would it be different, if at all? Well, it is actually a planet-sized object. If Io were orbiting on its own around the sun, it would probably be called a planet. It's way bigger than Pluto. It's, it's uh, bigger than our moon. It's um, not as big as Mercury, but a couple of the other of, of Jupiter's large moons are bigger, or one of them is bigger than Mercury. So it is a big planet-sized world experiencing very active volcanism, which is just uh, super neat. And so it it's uh, hyperheated, it's hypervolcanic, and studying it could tell us a lot about what volcanism and activity was like on Earth very early in its formation. 
after it had been um, globally molten and as it started to kind of settle down into its modern planethood, it would have passed through a period that looked somewhat Io-like. Now, Earth is a lot bigger, so proportionally its volcanoes would be smaller. They wouldn't be spewing as far out into space. But the the style of volcanism, the um, the chemical composition of the lavas and that kind of stuff would actually be pretty similar. And it's it's drastically different to what you see on Earth volcanoes today. And so it would be pretty fascinating to study for comparison to the early Earth. Now, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you about the China has a rover on the moon. And um, very interestingly, they seem to have sprouted cotton or <laughs> some sort of a plant on there as an experiment. <laughs> which would mean that cotton is the second species from Earth to go to the moon. Um, what are you, any views on that? What, what did the Chinese intend to do geologically with, with this uh, moon rover on the far side of the moon? Well, Chang'e 4 um, is the, the lander mission, landed on the far side of the moon inside Von Karman Crater, which itself is inside the South Pole Aitken Basin, which is one of the biggest impact structures in the solar system. And so uh, the lunar community has been excited about landing in the South Palatian Basin for a long time because it's such a big impact basin that it very likely punched all the way through to the lunar mantle. And by going into a crater to study the rocks there with a space mission, you can actually study the chemistry of the lunar mantle. Um, unfortunately, the, the Chang'e 4 mission doesn't have the full complement of chemical experiments you would really want on it to study that kind of stuff. But um, it will get some really interesting data, and the rover has neat little ground-penetrating radar and stuff like that. The lander itself is not doing so much geology. It's going to be um, doing primarily ultraviolet... I'm sorry, that's the Chang'e 3 mission. It's going to be doing radio astronomy from the far side. And the reason you like to do radio astronomy from the far side of the moon is because you're using the entire moon to block out all of the noisy radio transmission from Earth. So you, they have the quietest radio sky that any human has ever been able to observe. And so that's going to be uh, some pretty interesting uh, radio astronomy science. Not really my cup of tea, but it's going to be new, uh, very cool stuff to study. And so those are the main things that, that people are excited about for a far side mission. It's also just a cool technical feat. There's no reason that United States couldn't do it, but we haven't. And this really is a big major first in lunar exploration to land on the far side. The um, biology experiment that you mentioned wasn't uh, actually an experiment on the mission. It was one of two experiments selected in a public competition to propose uh, missions for inclusion on the Chang'e 4 lander. And so it was contributed by a Chinese university, uh, students working on that project. And and the experiment is actually over now. The um, Chang'e 4 has gone into its first lunar night. The sun has set. It's going to be dark and cold for two weeks and um, the experiment is not uh, heated, is not able to survive the lunar night. So that experiment is over. Interesting. It's, it's interesting to see, like you said, the different cultures and how different countries view the exploration of space. But it's also the more the merrier. A lot of fun and a lot of science coming from many different countries these days. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. You know, there's there's a lot of people who are trying to paint the Chinese landing as part of a rekindling of some kind of space race. And I really hate that framing because... There's so much international collaboration. There are European instruments on the Chinese lander. Our OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has entirely European-built instruments. They're collaborating with the Japanese mission that's also doing asteroid sample return. There's space enough for everybody. The solar system is so huge that we we all accomplish a lot more through collaboration than we do through competition. It is, and if everyone's asking different questions, the global situation of science becomes richer. Yep, agreed. All right. We are out of time. Emily, thanks for uh, joining us today, and I hope you'll come back at some point. My pleasure. What might we learn from a sample return mission from Mars? Certainly clues about its geologic history, but more, we may find evidence of past life. Mars may already be hinting at this. From structures seen on Mars that resemble ancient fossilized bacterial mats here on Earth, to odd transient emissions of methane detected by Curiosity, of which life is on the table as the possible origin of. We are set to explore our solar system at levels of detail never before possible. But it's not just Mars. Sample return missions from asteroids, comets, and even the moons of the solar system are all within our grasp. What we will find will both surprise us and also confirm things we already suspected. The decades to come are going to be very interesting indeed. That was a good interview today, John. Yeah, I liked it. It was. When you're finished, John, there's 12 centimeters of snowfall that needs clearing from the driveway. What? I did that yesterday. 
and the city was supposed to plow for us, they're going to get a strongly worded letter. Ah, I guess they've seen your car and assumed that you won't be going anywhere. I'll list it for sale. Don't you sell the LeBaron. I need it for things. What things? You know, John-type things. You mean since the state trooper ticketed you for using your rascal on the highway again? The LeBaron is not for sale until Elon Musk offers a Tesla with wood grain side panels and Corinthian leather interiors. Luxury is everything. And on that note, next week will be part two of my recent interview with Dr. Abraham Loeb of Harvard. See you Thursday.